Welcome to Audiobooks from Hell. I am your host, Sean DeRager. Um, I am very excited for today's show. I've been wanting this uh, this interview, this conversation to happen for some time. And uh, today on the podcast, he has, I think, over 300 titles now to his name, Joe Hempel. Uh, or maybe that's including, uh, uh, you know, pseudonyms. I'm not sure. But uh, cl- I'm looking here. It's close to 300 anyway. It's, just, it's 300. We're going to round up. Joe Hempel <laughs> joins me on the <laughs> podcast today. Joe, welcome. Hey, thanks, Sean. I appreciate you having me. Yes, 300 titles uh, under my name, and then I do have a pseudonym with some extras. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I have a, I have a, I have a burner name, uh, which will not be mentioned because uh, that title crashed and burned. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, welcome to the podcast. Uh, we are talking, of course, uh, audiobook narration. This is a podcast, very niche, uh, where I'm talking to audiobook narrators, authors, uh, people who dig the genre and uh and audiobooks uh, in general so that's kind of the gist of the show and uh joe you have been uh one of my favorite narrators for quite some time since, since i started this journey and um one of the reasons being was when i first started you were uh one of the few people to kind of take me under under your wing uh and offer good <laughs> advice And there's a lot of people who offer really good advice um but what i appreciated about you and early on in this um you're a straight shooter you're a no bullshitter and you gave me some really solid advice that I could have either, you know, told you, you don't know what you're talking about. Or I could have said, hey, you know what? This guy knows what he's talking about. And may- maybe I should pivot here. And uh, so I really appreciate that's kind of how we met and kind of, you know, started yeah. this, uh, this uh, you know, friendship. So I appreciate you coming on. I'm glad we can talk. Yeah, no, I appreciate being on here. There, There's, you know, there's a few people that you, you kind of when you sit back and you, and you look at all of the different narrators that are out there and you see kind of how they, they act online and how they react to certain things. And you, you kind of talk about like listening to quality and things like that. And sometimes you can point out and be like, you know what, this guy or this girl has something, has that, has something here. And it's like, this could really hurt them. And this person looks <laughs> like they really want to succeed. So I've, I come from a school of hard knocks. I, I worked in professional wrestling for 10 years. And if you suck, you suck. Like there was no, <laughs> hey, maybe you should do this a little bit better. It was, oh, wow, that was the worst piece of shit I had ever <laughs> seen in my entire life. You're never going to make it if you don't change. Right. And that's where I came from. And that's what actually happened to me when, when I started audiobooks. Because I kind of came in in the same way, and I left for three months because I was like, "Whoa, wait, maybe okay, maybe this isn't for me." <laughs> but there's always something in the back of my head wanting me to go back and wanting me mm-hmm. to go back, and so I didn't pay attention to how people were saying it. I paid attention to what was being said. Exactly. Exactly. You know? Yeah, and that's so. like with with any industry that you try to get in. I mean, the thing is, like with audiobook narration, with voiceover in general, yeah, there are college courses you can take. A lot of people mm-hmm. that I know kind of stumbled into it kind of in a roundabout way. I had a radio background, but this is all different different from radio. Podcasting mm-hmm. is different from radio. It's all different. And you kind of either have to learn, sink or swim, and and the value is the people who've been doing it and the, the information you can glean off of them for free until... They say, "Hey, you know what? I've helped you quite a bit. Maybe you got to pay me some money, <laughs> and then and then you then yeah. you pay your money, or then you get a coach, you know." Mm-hmm. But I'm I'm very much the kind of person that I want to gather as much information as I possibly can, and hope mm-hmm. maybe maybe I can do a decent job at this and, and learn. So, um, but that's the audiobook narrator community for sure has been um, just fantastic with all that. So. Um, before we get started and talking about your journey and everything, is there any audiobooks that you're listening to that, uh, that do you have, do you have time to listen to other audiobooks? Um, absolutely. I, I listen to, uh, so right now during our, you know, uh, pre apocalypse, apparently, <laughs> <laughs> um, I basically, I get up and then I work in the morning, then I go to my girlfriend's house and I spend all day with her family and then I go back home and, and go to bed. And so it's about a 30 minute drive each way. So I listen to audiobooks. If you're an audiobook narrator, and I see this all the time and it drives me nuts. If you're an audiobook narrator and you don't listen to audiobooks, <laughs> that is literally part of your job. Yes. <laughs> you know, writers read audiobook lists, audiobook narrators need to listen yes. and listen to the people that 
are doing what you want to do or getting the books that you want to get are doing all sorts of things, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, and occasionally I do, I, I like to pick up books that, uh, you know, so my friends have done and, and take a mm-hmm. listen because, you know, you want to support the people around you and they're, they're supporting you and things like that. But, you know, if there's something you're having trouble with that um, maybe you can't work in a coaching session or anything right away, what audiobook might have that in it? Um, I did a book a, a while ago called uh, The Haunted Forest Tour by Jeff Strand and uh, somebody else, but I can't remember his name. <laughs> um, that was basically like Jurassic Park with ghosts and monsters in the forest. And, nice. you know, they started, it, it kind of came out like this little, you know, kind of came out really kind of in a, uh, a horror fashion, like they were building it up. And then they were like, hey, no, this train is taking you into this haunted forest and blah, 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 blah. You know, it was kind of fun and kind of joking around. And then it slowly gets serious and starts to build. I'm like, okay, so how do I, how do I do that? How do I take something like this awe and this wonder and turn it into subtly just turn it into terror? Mm-hmm. So I got Jurassic Park. I got oh, the okay. unabridged Jurassic Park and I listened to Scott Brick. Okay, perfect. You know, um, something like that can help you over and over again. And a lot of the questions that get, get asked can be answered. What have you heard in every single other audiobook? Not, well, what's the author say? Because sometimes you don't have access to the author. Sometimes they're dead. Yeah. And then with like Gary Brandner of the Brain Eaters, he's 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 gone. He is not with us, <laughs> so I yeah. can't ask him any questions. I can, I mean, I did uh, <clears throat> recently did um, Legion by William Peter Blatty. I, I couldn't ask him any questions because he's mm-hmm. gone. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So, what do you hear the people that you want to, what you're aspiring to be like, what your career path looks like? Totally. You know, what do they do? Yeah. I'm uh, I'm actually listening to Vampires uh, uh, by John Stakely, narrated by uh, I think it's Tom. I want to say Weiner, but it's spelled Weiner. Uh, but I don't know. I don't want to offend <laughs> Tom here. But it's uh, it's, it's fantastic. He also did uh, the narration for John Stakely's Armor, and um, nice. and he has the voice that I don't have. He has the gruff R.C. Bray type, you know. But mm-hmm. um, perfect for these stories because it's these men's men no bullshit guys, you know, and, uh, just mm-hmm. fantastic. So I, I highly, I mean, John Stigley w- left us bef- way before he should have. He was actually working on sequels to vampires and to uh, armor when he oh, passed away. No. And, um, but uh, these books are great. Um, just wonderfully narrated. Uh, they're not overbearing as far as the tough guy narration, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. that can be grating for certain people, but just right. wonderful like the vampires especially i think i'm enjoying it more than armor so that's what i'm currently listening to i i, I just kind of threw it on i didn't really have a reason to this time around but uh um sometimes but i do that same thing like if i'm going to narrate a certain thing or especially a genre that i'm not used to um i'll totally try to find something and listen to that and see how they approached it so yes. and most of the time it's uh it's different uh than i would have approached it or than i would have thought and that's what i wanted to talk about here as we start talking about your journey was um because you're a horror guy, I'm a horror yes. guy, um, and that's kind of was like, oh, Joe Hempel narrates a lot of horror stuff. I think we could be friends. Um, and before I did, I hadn't even heard you before, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to this this horror story, and he's gonna narrate it like it's scary, you know? Like in my mind, <laughs> no. I'm thinking that's how it's gonna be narrated, and then and I, I had the same same exact uh, reaction with Matt Godfrey. It's like it was the most I was not expecting your voice for that story um but it all worked and that was a huge lesson for me with um just with expe- expectations and just because it's a, a, a genre doesn't necessarily mean it, it takes a certain voice for that genre so what what was kind of your first um hurdles that you did you have any hurdles when you started narrating horror was it just kind of you know what what, what was your kind of learning curve when you jumped into this I, I didn't have any. I didn't. I had tech. I had technological hurdles, like I think okay. everybody does. Um, right. I literally, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, <laughs> used a Zoom H2 mic inside a little box with foam awesome. on a freaking kitchen table. Hey, I didn't man. have a DAW. I recorded <laughs> straight to an SD card. Oh man! And 
I, I have a degree in audio and video production. Like I mm -hmm. actually, I graduated from college with a degree. So I know how to deal with, I do, I knew how to make my audio meet ACX specs right out of the gate. I understood what those numbers were and how to meet them. Um, and so I knew how to manipulate, manipulate my audio. Um, <clears throat> and I don't ever recommend anybody do what I did ever. <laughs> um, and so um, I'm, I'm coming up to the end of term on, on some of these and, and I kind of hope they go off profile. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but mine was tech technological. I was a book reviewer before I got into audiobooks, um, And so I was already kind of ingrained in the horror community with all of these up, like they're not really up and comers now, mm -hmm. but um, you know, they're pretty established, but it was guys like Glenn Roth, Jonathan Jans, um, uh, uh, Tim Tim Wagner. I, I won't say he's up and coming. He did a lot more than I thought he did. Um, you know, all of these Sowing publishing co publishing uh, authors. Um, you know, a couple of them I think had some decent stuff with like uh, the old Leisure Horror book line, but mm -hmm. a lot of them, you know, were, were were brand new. And I was reviewing their work, and I really enjoyed it. And some of them, you know, took off. Um, so I was already kind of ingrained in this horror community. So I just approached authors right out of the bat. I, I, the first book that I ever, the first real book that I ever got on ACX. And, and when I say real book, I mean like full length novel. Um, <laughs> I didn't audition for her. I went straight to the author and was like, Hey, I reviewed your book. I'm kind of interested in uh, audiobook narration. So what do you think? And he's like, okay. Um, and so, you know, and the, and the catalyst to get me started is I reviewed an audio book poorly and whoever the narrator was, was like, if you think you can do such a better job, why don't you do it? <laughs> and so I'm like, I kind of like, I enjoy audio books. So, okay. And, um, I have a friend on, on Facebook, um, a couple friends on Facebook, they were, do, they did their podcast novels and stuff like that. And I noticed uh, T Morris had done this for uh, Keith Ari DeCandido. And I went to T Morris and I'm like, Hey, how did that happen? And he was like, Oh, ACX. And I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. And so I just went to ACX, started mm -hmm. doing the research, did a few books, found the group, got yelled at, went away, came back and here we are. <laughs> so, so, so you had a, so you had a moment where you were like, Oh my God. Uh, and I had that too. And that was kind of what you and a few others kind of came and <laughs> uh, talked me down from the ledge um on war bots but um uh what was it that kind of brought you back what reignited the spark because it is hard to take criticism i'm very stubborn and i find i've had to really learn how to take uh constructive criticism and mm -hmm. as I had to learn how to deal with uh, reviews and negative reviews was one of the first things you and I discussed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I really had to, I had to overcome a lot and like you know um, of anxiety and everything. So what what was it um, specifically that after taking the time off, what what brought you back? Was it just this thing that kept gnawing at you that you that it you kept, just enjoyed it? Kind it? Of kept not, yeah, it kept gnawing at me. I really love the performance aspect i love being part of the community um horror at that point five years ago was starting to to boom a little bit mm -hmm. and nobody wanted to do horror and i'm just kind of like well maybe i can slide on in there mm -hmm. and so i just started reaching out and i you know i i ended up reaching out and you know those books didn't make a whole lot of money but that was the direction I wanted my career to go. I was very conscious of the types of books I did and how I wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it wasn't until I did actually a, a nonfiction book that it like took off and has made, you know, like was one of my first royalty share titles that was like, holy crap, <laughs> you know? Um, and I was able to upgrade and, you know, things like that, take that audiobook right. money and, and, Everything I got in that business early on, everything I reinvested. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just extra income for my family. It was I want to build this. So every little bit I got, I don't care if it was twenty bucks, I don't care if it was fifty bucks, or it could have been two hundred bucks. It was reinvested. What can I use this for to make this better? To make me better and make me more attractive to mm -hmm. authors. So, you know, yeah. That's just kind of 
how that that's just kind of how that happened and then you know it went from that little zoom mic to an at2020 usb mic which you know usb mics are horrible i didn't but i it was a step up from what i had Mm -hmm. and i couldn't afford an interface at the time but I, i got a book with audible studios that was like 15 hours long from a new york times bestseller who was like i want him to do my book so i did that book and I took every single bit. I, I took all of the money I got from that and I built my first booth and studio. And from that point on, you know, that's when everything started coming, coming in. I, I yeah. set aside the time. I made a lot of sacrifices. I slept three hours a day for like two and a half years. Ugh. And I'm talking sun, I'm talking seven days a week. I worked third shift. You know, I would, I would come home. I would sleep from 9 a.m. to like, uh, 1231 something like that if i could mm-hmm. you know sometimes you just can't fall asleep i'd mm-hmm. pick up my son from school he would go home to his mom's after uh, they got off work i would record until i had to go back to work <sighs> you know it was a grueling grueling time and it was exhausting man i can't even imagine paid off oh, I, because i i have a day job i have a family mm-hmm. and i yeah. i there's times where I'm like, okay, I'm going to stay up late and I'm going to get, I'm going to get two finished hours done. And right. after that, like I get 45 minutes finished done. <laughs> That's after being in the studio, like being in the booth for like, cause I'm still kind yeah. of developing my craft to take a little bit longer. Sure. And I'm like, I can't literally cannot s- s- be in here anymore. I can, my mouth does not work. I can't do it. You know, <laughs> right, um, right. I, I can't even imagine the exhaustion, <laughs> uh, you know, mm-hmm. because I've thought about it. I've been like, how do I pivot to get to do this full time? You know, but then again, I, I weigh the day job. It's a really great job. So um, what was it just you trying to get from this third shift thing, the day, the day job thing? Was that your drive? What was the drive to be like, this is what I want to do, like hands down for a living? Because that's not an it. easy, cause just because you loved it. I loved it. I, I loved it. I wanted to make this my career. Mm-hmm. I loved the people in it. I loved mm-hmm. the connections. You know, I love being able to play in all of these authors' worlds. I love being able to uh, make people feel things. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a terrible writer. I cannot put words together in ways a lot of people can. I don't have that skill. I can't tell eloquent stories, you know, uh, um, from my head, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> you know, that, that just doesn't come out of my brain like that. So when I get a good piece of writing mm-hmm. and I can really sink into it and I can, I can see and, and hear the melody of the story and I can take, you know, someone from kind of a, an excited, Hey, we just bought a new house to holy shit. This thing's taunted. We're going to die. Um, and take them on that roller coaster ride that there is nothing better. And, you know, one of the things that we do that I don't think a lot of people realize is um, we provide a lot of entertainment for those who can't read, who can't yes. physically read, be, <clears throat> excuse me, be it because they have a lot of dyslexic issues or, you know, they don't know how to read or they're blind. Like we provide, we give them the ability to read. Yeah. And, you know, hearing something like that come back at you Mm -hmm. just makes it all worth it. Yeah. Because you, at that point, you have a drive and a purpose that's outside of just you. So. No, totally. I I just had my first kind of uh, someone who was was blind and had listened to some of my things and they reached mm -hmm. out to me. And uh, they said, you know, they were just grateful. And I was like, wow, it puts a whole new perspective on this whole thing that I hadn't even necessarily thought about. I knew that that was a possibility, but to have that connection was uh, was really, really awesome to have. It was, uh, mm-hmm. it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, so what I like about you is like you're you tend the, the, the books I've listened to. They do have kind of an underlying underlying sense of humor because. I do hear that in your in your voice and with your characters. You do have, you do the, you know, kind of lighthearted, snarky, sarcastic very well. 
Um, but then you can transition to, into other things. Um, you know, like more serious horror would, which would, I guess, Legion would be, you know, more serious. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, what, what's your favorite thing? What's your favorite, uh, uh, I guess, type of story to do? Do you find yourself kind of looking for more humor or, um, which, I guess, which types of stories are a little more, um, I guess, challenging? Cause you were kind of nervous about Legion. <laughs> I was nervous about Legion. Legion was actually very challenging. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because I'm reading this book and there's a lot of very introspective stuff about it. You know, I think one of the biggest complaints of the audiobook is it feels like a flat read. And mm. when you actually read the book, it's a lot of just one character's thoughts. There's not a ton of suspense until you get about three quarters of the way into it, mm -hmm. in which you finally, you know, you you speak to the Gemini killer and it links back to the exorcist and <clears throat> things like that. And that's really two sections of the book. Mm -hmm. It's it's not horror, it's a police procedural. And he his whole um, you know, Kinderman's whole thing is he's very introspective about what's it all mean this you know religion in the world and you know the point of mankind and he's just he's very introspective and he's very you know you know hey we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about this and before i go what about this atkins <laughs> you know yeah you know, did you ever think of that why do i got to do all the thinking you know and it's all it's kind of lighthearted joking and it's just kind of a lot of banter and it's not it is suspense. It is thriller, but it's very much more of a police procedural. How are they going about doing it? And then, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> you know, you get to the point where all of this comes together in this one guy in the asylum. And that's where you can really sink in and you can differentiate and you can like really play with it. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes, you know, none of the characters aren't very differentiated. You know, there's, there's some cadence, you know, I do change cadence. I do change different things. Um, you know, I give them the person, I give them the properties of their personality right. that's described in the book. You know, the hardest thing was not to go back and watch the movie before doing the book, <laughs> you know, because you're not, you're not creating the movie. You're creating a different experience. Um, and, and I think that I've succeeded in that, you know, for, for better or for worse. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I like it. I, I walked away from it thinking, okay, this is great. Um, but it was very challenging because you want to go to certain places or you want to be able to find ways to bring out the characters mm -hmm. when there wasn't a lot mm -hmm. there. Right. And I find uh, that um, I find that more like novels like that, more of the uh, grounded novels. Um, I've done a couple, but I find those are hardest <laughs> to do as far as like differentiating the characters with your voice, because I like doing character voices. I have fun with like sci fi and fantasy. You can go crazy. But in some of these kind of more serious horror stories, I'm doing I'm doing a cyberpunk novel right now. Where, where mm -hmm. it's sci-fi, but it's like sci-fi a la like Blade Runner, where there's okay. not a bunch of crazy wild characters. It's not, but it's not space opera where you can get. There's not aliens. There's not. So it's like, it's yeah. this fine dance of finding the character of the voice, but not necessarily, I guess, trying to put on that voice. It's really. It's really crazy. Like, what do you prefer? Do you prefer the characters, like more kind of outlandish, or or do you like the more subtle? What's what's your preference? I I, I like the more subtle. Um, okay. To me, outlandish characters take me right out of the book. Okay. Um, right. Unless you are very, very, very good at doing it. If I'm listening to a Star Wars book and it's narrated by Mark Thompson, oh man, he sounds like nineteen thousand different people. He's <laughs> so amazing. Good. Um. <laughs> If I want to listen to something, something, you know, if I want to listen to a sci-fi and they're talking to aliens and like, 
they're doing like weird voices that are out there and it's obvious they had to take a breath to change their voice and get into like i just <laughs> find it so disruptive uh -huh. um interesting you know one of the things that i one of the things that i love about matt godfrey and his horror mm -hmm. is we have two very different approaches but his his subtlety and his nuance in his storytelling, uh -huh. it's not broad in a wide range of of you know vocal inflections. It's um, but you can tell the difference, and you could tell what he's prepared for, and you could tell uh, that he really digs in. Uh -huh. And um, you know, listening to him is exactly what you would want, in, in my opinion. Like uh -huh. you, you would you want to just turn on the audiobook and you want to be immersed in the story he gets out of the way and lets the author's words shine mm -hmm. and that to me is some of the best audiobooks we're not creating an audio drama mm -hmm. um you know i'm never going to be able to i just recently was uh at a at an event um with uh, scott brick here in houston he was uh, doing a book signing thing with uh, steve barry and um one of the things he said was like, I'm never going to be able to do a female voice, but I trust the author's words to let the listener know, to right. guide the listener. You know, I don't, he was like, I don't have a, a big range, but I let the, I let the author's words come through. You have to trust the list, the author and have to trust his words will get through to the listener. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big mistake that a lot of people are making is they don't let the author they don't have trust in the author's words they have to do all of these accents all of all of everything mm -hmm. um you know you know if the character has a british accent of course use a british accent i'm not saying don't do that unless it's very very poor um <laughs> because a, a bad accent is worse than no accent yeah um, but you know in my opinion you don't have to do all of that to have a good audiobook I agree. Yeah, no, and that that's one of the first because I did a few books before I took any coaching. So I was mm -hmm. like, I got this. I have drama coaching. I've done, you know, right. 20 years ago. I got this. <laughs> um and then by the third book I was like, I'm maybe I need coaching. So I I um I uh did a coaching session with Jamie Madler or Madler. Oh, she's so good. And that was the first thing she tried to strip away from me was this performance. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a performance, but the acting of it all. Yeah, you know, yeah, I am yeah. putting on a show for you. Like, yeah, that you're was, not. She basically took out like a cat of nine tails and whipped the fuck out of me. <laughs> like, I have a, I have a story with uh, with Jamie Matler as well. <laughs> um, Please, I was, um, I was narrating um, the Rising by Brian Keane, and um, oh shit, my. Uh, sorry, I, th I thought I heard my phone be like, hey, you've got 5%. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was at APAC and I was doing director diagnostic and I got Jamie Mallard. Oh, man. And one of the things that she told me, and I'll never forget this, is I'm narrating the opening pages. And she like stopped me like five times. <laughs> slower. Yes. Slower. No. Slower. Okay. See where it says he? Replace that with I. How do you feel when you say I instead of he? You know? And I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> like, I, it was just something I never thought of. Yeah. So I hadn't narrated that book yet. I went, I narrated it. It was nominated for the first uh, awards they get to hear now, like the Audiobook awesome. Reviewer Awards. It got nominated for an award that year because she completely, like, flipped my entire understanding of a perspective on its mm -hmm. head and i'll never forget it she's so good it took her mm -hmm. 15 minutes 15 yeah. minutes that's how good like good coaches can do they can you know there's there's a thousand people out there that say they can they can coach but a great coach like her can listen to like 10 or 15 minutes and pinpoint exactly what you need to do yep yep she told me she and, goes and, uh and, oh no okay. and what do, what do you say i interrupted you i, I apologize Oh, no, no, no. I just said, you know, she can tell you exactly. It just, you know, make you better in a yeah. short amount of time. 
So yeah. imagine what they can do over a few sessions. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. One of the first things he kept saying was, um, bring it back, bring it back, act like, act, just mm-hmm. read it like you're boring, <laughs> you know, more boring, Yeah. more boring, more like strip it down, strip it down, strip it down, strip it down. Mm-hmm. And then we brought it back to, but yeah, I mean, that was like one of the biggest eye opening, you know, mm-hmm. it was just so eye opening that. Because before, you know, I was like, I don't need, it's just reading a book. I don't need coaching. Maybe not. Maybe someday when I can afford Mm -hmm. it. But that one session changed my entire trajectory. Um, And I'll I'll, I'll never, I'll I'll always say whenever there's somebody new asking me, you know, how, how should I, what should I do to become an audiobook narrator? Mm -hmm. First thing I do, there's two things. It's simple. Go to narrator's roadmap. Mm-hmm. dot com is it dot com um yeah. narrator's roadmap get a coach have a yeah. coach do a session with you see if you're even you know if you can even take co- take direction and mm-hmm. then decide what you want to do that's it those two steps you know but uh, don't yeah, absolutely don't just dive in like i did for sure that's <laughs> that's not the easy way to go it's not it's it's not um so yeah no it's it's and that and that's the thing. She she pulls you away from the story, like get out of the way of the story, and mm-hmm. then you can start to add a little bit of the emotion, like add emotion into it. But you know, like I said, trust that the author will get through to the listener. Mm-hmm. You what know? have been what have been some of the books that you've worked on that have been um, that have really challenged you, but you walked away like knowing you know knowing more than did before or or had a uh, just a just kind of a weird scenario that changed you know your perspective on narration is there any books that stand out through your journey that you can pinpoint as kind of like milestones you know to kind of that that made you where you're at today you can think of um Three hundred titles not, is a lot of titles. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it is a lot of titles. I, I am definitely a, a workhorse. I don't, um, you know, I try to to do as much as I can. Um, you know, I like staying. I like staying busy recording and in the booth. It's what I love to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the my first milestone book that I really thought I could do, like I could do this, was. Um, a book called it was the uh, Jonathan Shade series. It was called like Modern Sorcery, Acheron Highway, and um, and uh, uh, Dragon's Gate. I did the first three, and I, I felt like so connected to the characters, and I felt that came through. And I'm like, okay, I need to do this for every single book. I need to find a connection, mm-hmm. a personal connection to all of this, so that my emotion comes through when I'm reading, because I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't prep books because my emotion isn't going to be genuine. No, I think, that, no, I think that's bullshit. You know, prep, not prep, when you, prep. when you get to a point, well, when you get to a point where you listen and you, and when you have done X amount of books and you have a full schedule and stuff like that, you're not going to prep like you used right. to, Totally. but you don't really, you don't really need to, you know what to look for, you know, mm-hmm what's there. You can find that connection. It's, it, it's faster because you know what you're looking for and you know, the style of the writing, and things like that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But, um, but from there, you know, n- not too long ago, I, I had never done, um, fantasy, like epic fantasy. Um, it always scared me because, you know, epic fantasy, I think, you know, it's British accents. It's, you know, all of this, it's Scottish, it's British. It's, you know, everything's like that. Yeah, <laughs> and I did this series called um, uh, "The Age of uh, Ages of Merlin" um, by James E. Wisher, and it was kind of it was more urban fantasy than fantasy. Uh-huh. Um, and there there was a point where it took place over in a few couple books where it took place over in Britain, um, but from there uh you know i, I kind of got more comfortable because you know i was dealing with magic and things like that i got more comfortable with it and then i did a, a series by him called uh, 
the oh god dragon spire chronicles it was a six book series and this was fantasy Mm -hmm. um and i was going through it and i was like you know what i don't really have to have that accent and i went back and i listened to like eye of the world and i listened you know to to like um uh um Uh, oh, I can't think of the title, but it was, it was kind of like that. But, um, but they didn't have one, you know, occasionally it came out for some characters, but it didn't have one. Uh huh. And I'm like, okay. I was like, all right, so maybe I can do this. So I ended up getting that six book series. I'm like, oh, huh, all right. Next thing you know, Athon Publishing contacts me. Hey, would you like to do this Foundling Wizard series? Master to Apprentice, Foundling Wizard and, you know, Wizard's Education and stuff like that. Epic, fa- epic young adult fantasy. Okay, sure. Now I'm doing another Wizards, you know, the, <laughs> the WizBiz series right. takes place in this fantasy world. So I'm like, I went from zero to like 15 fantasy titles. And I'm like, and, and they're not getting terribly, the, the reviews aren't terrible. They're, they're good. And I'm like, huh, maybe, maybe I can do this. <laughs> That's awesome. You know? Yeah, uh, you know, um, you know, I still go back to my roots with horror. I love horror. Um, what is it about so- horror that that you love so much? Because I I always I find myself asking that question too. And people ask me that a lot. I mean, my mom asks me all the time, like, yeah. why horror? <laughs> but it's- for you, like, what what is it about horror? Um, I want to see if 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 we gel here. You get this you can get the feeling of of being scared and wondering like and you can let your mind go to those places Mm -hmm. but you're safe like it's Mm kind of like a haunted house you get to experience what it's like in a way to have someone on your heels to have these paranormal experiences without actually having to have it you know Mm -hmm. um my favorite movies are like the 80s slasher movies you know i will always love friday the 13th and nightmare on elm street and you know things like that those were always those were my things growing up i didn't get into a lot of the paperbacks from hell Mm -hmm. um um, when i was reading unfortunately i read a lot of mainstream horror when i was a kid so you know my bookshelf is filled with stephen king and dean and, and things like that um, mine too. I jumped on the paperbacks from hell bandwagon just cause it's, I love the artwork and I hope to, hope they'll have time to read them. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it was just, you, you, you were able to feel scared, but you knew you were going to be okay mm-hmm. because you, you still had that safety of whatever, of, of what's being around you and allow and, and getting to take people on that journey. You know, I don't try to be like, oh, it was a dark and stormy yeah. night. You know, I just want to sit down with somebody. Like, I, I approach it like I'm sitting down with somebody. But like, hey, listen to this. Yeah. Like, you know, we're going to head over to this house. There's some things going on inside. I'll tell you about them as we're going. You know? Right. And tell that story because, you know, I, I want to create such an intimate experience. And one of the things that I love doing that you can't, it's difficult to pull off, um, in my opinion. I don't know, it might be easier for some people, but <clears throat> it's a jump scare in an audiobook. Oh, yeah. I haven't come across any of those yet. Um, you know, where they turn the corner and someone like screams, ah, you know, or whatever, <laughs> and things like that. So it's like, you know, you don't, you know, if you scream, you know, for a jump scare, you'll be able to blow someone's ear drums, ear drums out and on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. But, you don't want to do that. You know, so you just you don't want to do that. So you know, you just you know, and and this is this is where you know a good prep comes in, is you can you just you mark that on your script, mm-hmm. and you can you can build the tension, and you build it not by changing your voice much. You like change change the volume, maybe change your pacing change you know something like that but you can build the tension and you can slow and you can just you can mark where it starts to build you know 
um, is it when they turn the corner here, where's this, where's this? And I always have the scene playing in my head and I always mm -hmm. have like this music playing in my head as it's building. And I try to, you know, build to that crescendo and then I get real close to the mic and my voice drops, bah! you know, and it's <laughs> like, you know, you, you just get in there and you try to be like, holy shit, you know, and, and drive that point home. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that's one of my favorite things. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh. That's one of my favorite things to do in horror. It doesn't happen very often, but I right. love when it happens. Right. Yeah. I love the, uh, I, I love characters exploring, you know, dark hallways and, mm -hmm. and like, those are my favorite moments. I think when it's just a character or a couple of people exploring mm -hmm. something and it does get quiet yep. and, and the, their feelings and their fears in their heads and, and everything. That's, that's fantastic. Ha, have, have you ever narrated anything that you got done with that passage and you went, Holy shit, that was fucked up. One of the, uh, one of my favorite experiences narrating was, um, a book called uh, the house of long shadows by Amber Zipson. Mm -hmm. Um, I would narrate late into the night. Um, I think I was full time at that point. So I would narrate late into the night. And, um, at the at that point I was, I had a booth in, in the basement of the town home I was living in. And, um, at that point, like, you know, the house is making noise and stuff <laughs> like that in the book, uh -huh. but also outside the booth. Right. And it was like matching what was going on in the book. And I had to step away because <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is a little too real. So I'm going to step away and going and you go back and you kind of listen and you're like, okay, so this was, yeah, this was good. This added to everything because, <laughs> you know, I was kind of like, <clears throat> You, you know, I was in the story, but you're hearing like in real life what they're describing at times. And so you're like, okay, you know, I try to, I try to immerse myself into it as much as possible yeah. so that it comes through. But that got a little bit too immersive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have, I have an step, active imagination when I'm, when I'm narrating yes, too. I'm trying to that's exactly <clears throat> visualize what it in, in my head. Um, I, if, if I heard noises, I would just be like, God damn it. I got to edit that thing out later. I guess I got to, what, what am I going to, what am I going to do? Post, post on this is going to be awful. Um, uh, you know, I just, I don't even, I just send it to my editor and say, you deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm all nervous or paranoid now because, uh, Jennifer, um, another narrator, Jennifer Blom, she, uh, She's mm -hmm. done, done some editing for me. And every time before I get, I'm like, all right, you're going to edit this project. She goes, watch out for those nose farts. I'm like, great. Now I'm, now I'm paranoid about Doubly the nose, conscious. the nose farts and self-conscious about it. <laughs> so those are the funny. worst. <clears throat> they are. I don't learn. I can't, I can't find a, a, a fix, a really hard fix for it yet. I've tried the steam. I've tried everything. Yeah. So some days I don't, you know. I don't know. I don't know. I got, you know, it's my nose. It's my, Do what I, got, you can. I got a schnoz. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're running out of time here, so I'll start wrapping up here. But, um, um, Joe, I wanted to thank you for spending time with me and just chatting about, you know, your journey in, in this stuff and in the audio books. Um, what is, uh, what are you working on right now? Um, and what has been recently released that you can send people to? Uh, let's see what has been recently released. Um, it's probably like five in one day. Drop, one I don't been, know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the first whiz biz book, uh, was just released. Um, that's kind of an interesting concept. It was written in the eighties. So, you know, you'll, you'll hear people talk about like three eighty six computers and be <laughs> like, what? Um, and then, uh, that was, that was good. Legion came out in, in uh, January. That's always something I'll point to. Um, that was, um, made into the movie the exorcist three mm -hmm. um that was uh, a lot of fun i'll be uh working on jason parents uh what hides beneath i believe it's called uh in about two weeks um and i'm currently finishing up wizards education and i will be doing the third book in that series right after that so um next few weeks are 
are kind of uh, are kind of filled. Um, let's see, Ghostland by Duncan Ralston just came out. That is a brilliant book. I, awesome. It's fantastic. Um, if you buy the physical copy of the paperback book, he's got like a little um, augmented reality thing in the back of oh, the book cool. that you can use your phone. It's it's kind of neat. Uh, and then uh, two two big releases coming up. Uh, there's a 21 hour horror lit RPG called uh, Kaiju Battlefield Surgeon, oh my God. which is it is absolutely disgusting. It is <laughs> funny. It is weird. It is like, I don't know where 20 hours went, but it didn't feel like it was 20 hours really? because everything moved. Matt Denneman just did a great job. Uh, and then I had, did a book called uh, Back from the Future. It is uh, a little short book about uh, how Back to the Future came oh, to cool. be. Um, talks about, uh, you know, some of the, you know, written by a, a guy who does a Back to the Future podcast, um, has over 1 million streams, over 50 episodes. So... Um, those two will be coming out soon as well, and uh, I can't I can't wait for them. There's, there's just a lot right. of stuff going on. Good stuff. All right. Well, I will have uh, in the uh, in the show notes below, everybody. Um, I will have links to uh, voiceofjoey.com, so we can find all of uh, all of Joey's stuff there. And uh, there's a link to all of his audio audiobooks on Audible. And mm -hmm. uh, and uh, click away. Use those credits. You got it. Yet you, you got credits just in there. Use them on Joey's stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll be uh, uh, be doing some some nice stuff with uh, Amber Zipson's Asylum series coming up. Uh, Asylum is one of my favorite horror books that I've narrated, and it's a great trilogy. Awesome, and you've done a lot of stuff with them. That, that's what I love about this is when you find an, an author that you connect with, and they just keep bringing you a project. Here, I got this project coming up. I got this project coming up, and you've done a lot, <clears throat> a lot with him, especially. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we started becoming kind of uh, synonymous with each other um, as far as horror goes. Um, we're going to finish up, hopefully, the House of the Long Shadow series uh, in hopefully this year. Um, and then uh, and then I've got another title. It's an older title that uh, that I'm going to do uh, because I want to. I love, I love his writing. <laughs> so... <laughs> that's great. Um, but, by, but by far, of, of the stuff that's released for horror... Asylum came out in 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. Still one of my favorite horror titles that I have ever done. Awesome. Very cool. All right. Well, Joey, man, thank you so much for ta talking to me. I'm calling you Joey because this is Voices of, Voices of Joey here. So, I'm not, you know, Joe, Joey. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know. Uh, whatever. I, I just, <laughs> I go by whatever. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for chatting with me about, uh, about your work and everybody listening Grab, grab his stuff. Go to voiceofjoey.com and, and click away. Grab some stuff there. Thank you for listening. And uh, I think I'm talking to Grady Hendrix on the next podcast. So I'm super excited about that one. Uh, hopefully. I keep my fingers crossed. But we'll be discussing, of course, the whole paperbacks from hell thing that he unwittingly uh, unleashed on the world. So I'm excited to talk to him. So I'll talk to all of you guys next time. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. <laughs>